Hi, I'm uh, Jack Fox is my earth name, and I'm here today to talk about the project I'm working on to create a query language specifically for Urbit based on EFCOD's relational model. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this is about designing a query language and it's in the present tense. So you all have the opportunity after this to be informed contributors to this project, and I hope that you are because uh, yeah, it's not good for one person to be totally in charge of it. Now they say you should start all uh, presentations like this with a little humor. So I went out to our AI overlords and asked the last two versions of them uh, to give me a relational database joke. Now the first one I find actually a little bit cute and funny. Uh, why did the relational database break up with the NoSQL database? Because they couldn't agree about uh, relationships. That's pretty good. The second one has no humor at all, it's, uh, which I can't, I don't know what the meaning of that is. Either uh, you know, AI is regressing, which is entirely possible, or as it progresses, our AI overlord has no sense of humor at all, which is a little scarier. So uh, how many of you are familiar with the allegory of Plato's cave? Most of you. OK, so that's what we're trying to accomplish here. I think that. Uh, SQL is a, is a pale shadow of what a, a query language really should be. So we're going to try to make the, the, or the platonic form of a query language here. And that's, 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 the, that's the goal. So the brief over, overview is, you know, we're going to fully implement EFCOD's model, unlike what uh, SQL does. And if you know anything about SQL, you know that it is uh, deficient in several regards. Um, make it a little more composable than SQL. SQL has got problems with composability as well. And we're also going to make it time traveling. If you've uh, heard of the concept of a time traveling this or that or the other thing, a time traveling database merely means that we're able to uh, query the database at any particular time. It's state at uh, a particular time, the schema of the database, as well as the data in the database. Uh, so I'm going to take you through a scenario that is more or less uh, kind of like a real world scenario. And we'll take a few tangents. Um, you don't have to follow it all entirely. Uh, I just hope you get the, the major concepts out of it. So um, I, I assert that things that are based on theory are more powerful than things that are merely based on convention. So, in the case of uh, query language, we have the relational model to work off of. Uh, and it, in turn, is, uh, derives from set theory, where it takes uh, the concept of finite sets and operators on finite <laughs> sets that you can do stuff with, as well as first order predicate calculus, which sounds really important because we have at least two $5 words in there, as well as prefixing it with first, which makes it sound really important. All you need to take from that is we can uh, take conditional, uh, a set of conditionals that, that have uh, operators applied to them, and it all condenses down into one Boolean true or false statement. Um, there's also the, the idea of relations, um, which are, uh, I'm going to describe as table sets. The, the literature has you know, technical terms for them. Um, and we're also going to throw in a bit of type theory there. And there's already some type theory in uh, SQL but we're going to take it a little bit further. So here's the first thing to fix in SQL. Get rid of nulls, OK? So it's easy enough to just say, OK, we're not going to allow you to define tables with nulls, but there uh, are some other instances in uh, performing queries where with SQL you end up with nulls. We are going to completely eliminate nulls. Uh, so the fundamentals, the, basic of, the basics of this whole thing, uh, I'm going to be a little fast and loose with the terminology here because uh, yeah, I don't want to hit you over the head with the, the, uh, the, what the terminology is in the literature necessarily. But just think of uh, what we're dealing with here are 2D matrices of rows and columns. And uh, in our case, we're going to allow what I'm calling jagged rows. Uh, which don't exist in uh, SQL. 
And uh, I will explain later on how we can uh, use jagged rows in a type theoretic manner. So hold on to that thought for the time being. Um, they're also called a, a relation in the relational algebra, but like I said, let's not get hung up on the technical jargon. And rows themselves in this uh, situation, they, they form a set, okay? Columns over the rows, they also form a set. And the columns have labels. Uh, not all row sets, which is what I'm calling them now, are tables. I'm going to refer to tables as a very specific thing. In the uh, literature, they're called base tables, okay? But I'm just gonna call them tables. So uh, the last thing I wanna point out is that a table <clears throat> in really any kind of query language is gonna end up with some sort of canonical ordering, but they're really sets. And remember, sets are not ordered, but we have a canonical ordering kind of for convenience. And uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how that plays out a little later. So talk about tables and keys. Um, my first bullet point here, a key is a subset of tables, of table columns over rows with the same number of elements, or rows as the parent. Uh, sounds very complicated, and that is not a definition, okay? That is merely a property of uh, keys in relation to the data that they are keying. But if you think about it, we're taking this thing that exists of columns, right? And we're looking for preferably a, sub, a smaller subset where if you reduce that subset of rows, you can't reduce it, okay? So this sets us up for a one-to-one -one correspondence between keys and rows, which is what we want to achieve for indexing over, uh, over our, our tables and our table sets and our sets of data. Uh, and because we love Occam's razor, we want it to be the smallest one possible. Now, if your key exists only of columns that are already in your uh, set, that is called a natural key. Uh, the alternative to this is making up fake data and using that as a key. That is called an artificial key. Uh, unfortunately, from my experience in the real world, probably 95% of the databases out in the wild use artificial keys. Now, it's a whole nother talk about why natural keys are better. I'm not going to uh, go into that. I'm just going to let that assertion hang and uh, kind of take my word for it. Whoop, did I? What happened? Oh, there we go. Um, so always prefer the natural keys, not artificial keys. And a table now is a row set with a uh, rule-enforced key. So any data that goes into this table has got to follow the rules of uh, the key that we set up in order for it to add a unique row. Otherwise, uh, it's just a duplicate of what exists there and it gets compressed back down because we're dealing with sets, not with collections. And uh, the table, or base table in the literature, is the only form of persistent data in the entire system, okay? Everything else is ephemeral. There are uh, transformations of the data, which is the whole point of having a query language. Okay, so here's a, here's a table. Um, it exists of the columns, name and location, and it's a table of conferences. Uh, might look a little familiar to you. So uh, anybody want to uh, tell me what the natural key on this table should be? Name, comma, location. Name, location. Why? Because that's what the data is there. It's the only um, combination that distinguishes between events and future events. Good point. Because if we looked at this naively, and we just took into account the data that's already there, we could say, well, location is the natural key. It's actually smaller, right, than name and location. But uh, we need to take into account what, you know, what is the rule that's going to enforce uh, the, how, how we want this table to, to look and function. So let's move on and uh, develop uh, some more data tables in this system that will be useful for us. So let's, let's collect the attendees for our conferences. Um, so we're going to index them by the conference name and the location as well as the attendee. Now, here's a question for you. Um, what is the natural, natural key of a person? 
Now, I, I told you that a natural key involves the data that's already, already available, but let's say you could use any data that you wanted for, to describe a person, to index a person. What, what would it be? Pat <laughs> You looked ahead. <laughs> Uh, no, this is actually a trick question, because there are some entities out there in the real world for which the key that we make up is going to be uh, a compromise, okay? There is no natural key for humans. You might say, oh, well, how about biometrics? Well, uh, yeah, those have their own problems, but things like uh, name, social security number, all, all these things are potentially ephemeral. Uh, they p can, you know, so there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between some key that we can put in a database and a person. So yes, we, <laughs> we use PATP in our case as, as the compromise that we're talking about. Now in uh, ERQL, unlike in SQL, we're gonna require that every table has a primary key. Uh, so this is, a, in my mind, another of the pretty big deficiencies of the, the SQL databases is uh, and it has to do with the fact that they don't really enforce sets. So they've already uh, deviated from EFCOD's brilliant uh, vision of relational databases by not enforcing sets. And one of the ways they do that is not enforcing primary keys. But we're going to enforce primary keys. And the second thing you see down here is what's called a foreign key. And this is uh, a way of enforcing a relationship between two different tables. Uh, it's not necessary in order to make a relationship between two tables, but it is uh, useful and it enforces the relationship. So uh, this is called referential integrity in uh, the relational database literature, and that is a, that is a good name because it uh, enforces the integrity of the relationships between your data. So from there, we can start forming relationships. And in this case, we're going to form a relationship between uh, the conferences table and the conference attendees table. Uh, this doesn't give us any earth shattering information we didn't already have in the conference attendees uh, table, but it's, it's a demo, okay? So we want to keep it simple, simple and understandable. And by the way, join is the only proper relationship between tables in a relational database. Um, anybody want to disagree? Okay, <laughs> that's, that's, that's very good because we're gonna see in a minute uh, another kind of a relationship and I'm gonna show you that it's not actually what, you, what it appears to be on the surface. So uh, here we have the results of our uh, relationship and my question to you is this a table? A table the way I've been using it? And the answer is no. It's, it's, yes, it's a row set of uh, a relationship, but it's not persisted, okay? So this is an ephemeral uh, table, uh, table set or row set that we created from the pre-existing state of the database. Is the fact that it's not persisted, is that what makes it not a table? Or yes, yes. Jack, can you repeat the question that people are wanting? Uh, repeat. The, uh, it, what makes it not a table is that this is, um, this is a relationship that we created on the fly in order to observe it. So looking at it is, uh, is that an effect? I guess it kind of is. Uh, but it's not, this particular thing actually exists as the conference attendees table already, but the way I defined it uh, selecting the, the first column from um, the first table, the second column from the first table, and the third column from the second table is, uh, if this were more interesting data, it would look more, inter it would be more interesting, but it is not persisted in this form. It's persisted in the primitives that we constructed this out of, however. Um, another thing to point out is that in RQL, we start out with the from, from clause instead of the select clause. Uh, re reason being, it uh, reinforces to users of 
the language that uh, you first need to decide where the primitive parts are that you're getting this data from. Then you can uh, use the, an, the on clause to determine what the relationship between the various primitives of data are. And finally, then you select the columns that you're interested in. And by uh, selecting the columns, you've now uh, committed to an order of the column set. But remember, the co columns really are a set, so they have no or order all by, all by themselves. Uh-oh. Uh Those crazy people at Tassin, <laughs> they, they uh, scheduled another conference, and guess where they had it? In Cheyenne. Yes. Yeah, why is this a problem? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's essentially you get, you're, you're on the right track. The problem is we just created this new table of attendees, and now we won't be able to tell, uh, you know, who, who was at which uh, Tassin conference anymore. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of messed up. But fortunately, our friends over at the Zod Galaxy have an implementation where they have um, granted us read permission on their conference event table. And they've given us a few pieces of information of, about that. Um, they've given us the name of the database, the name of the table, and the name of the columns. And it's kind of intuitive what that all means because they, they, use, uh, they, have, they use meaningful names. Anyone ever heard of doing that in Urbit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're gonna take a stab at uh, uh, creating a new table of our own. And here's how we're gonna define it. Uh, we're going to call it the conference events table. It's got those uh, four uh, columns in it, the, the name of the event, the location, and the start and the end dates. Um, so what are we going to use as the primary key on this? If anybody wants to shout out the answer. And the second part of that question is, is there only one candidate key? Is there potential to have uh, Alter alternate keys. Everybody's full of lunch, so it's too, too sleepy to respond. Okay, um, we're also gonna uh, put a uh, foreign key on this to back to our conferences table to uh, keep, keep everything in sync so that we don't add new events that don't already exist in our conference table. So let's think about the primary key here. What are we gonna do? Well, it turns out we're going to uh, use the conference name and, and the start date as the index on our conference events table. And um, we're going to write a script here where we're going to, in our database, define the new table. We're there, then going to uh, write a statement to um, uh, select that data from Zod's database and populate our new table. Then we're gonna run a couple of queries to uh, count the number of conferences in uh, both those tables and then compare them. Now, um, a little note on the syntax here. Uh, we're commenting out the foreign key for reasons. Uh, but I just wanna point out that uh, in the language you can, you can comment things. Uh, we're selecting everything that's in Zod's table on faith. And this is where uh, the canonical ordering of the columns comes into play. So we're gambling that uh, Zod's canonical order is the same order that we defined uh, our columns in, because otherwise we, uh, this, this uh, script will fail if uh, the, the data that we're selecting doesn't have the columns ordered in the same way that we define them. So all, all makes sense. And uh, then we have the results of, our, uh, of what we did here. So the first statement gave us a system time because we're creating a new table, so we've updated uh, the schema of our, our system, of our database. The, the second uh, command that we uh, ran off here, uh, updated data. So we've now updated the data. And these two dates um, are, are crucial if we're going to do time traveling, which um, we'll talk a little bit more about. 
And you notice that the times are the same, and that's because scripts are atomic, meaning that they, the whole script either works or the whole script fails. So both the, the system time and the data time are the same. And uh, then we've got a count of the conference names from the conference events table that we just populated, and a count from the conferences table, and holy cow, they are not the same. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, looks like we might, we, might, we might have a problem here, or we might not. So let's uh, research this situation and figure out why it is. So let's um, do a new thing here, which is we, we saw we uh, created a relationship with a join. Now we've got something called a left join here. So I'm going to get back to that. And I'm going to tell you right now, this spoiler alert, that uh, that is not everything that it appears to be. So it appears that that set up a relationship. Uh, yes, it did, but it also did the inverse of a relationship. Um, and in the data that we got back, we see that we do indeed have another uh, event name there. So the Ask Eskimo Pat P in Ukivik. Anybody been there? No, it's better known as Barrow, Alaska. So, uh, and the date was uh, last December on the 14th of December. So it's pretty dark in Barrow there. And it turns out our friend Nanook up there, even though he had a great conference organized, he didn't publicize it very well and no one showed up. So now, uh, now we've got what I call the, the jagged result, which is uh, we do have one row in our set here that's got one less column than all the other rows. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but first we're going to uh, talk about what this fun, funny left join is up there. What is, what is that really? It's actually not a, it's not part of the um, relational algebra. It's a macro, what programmers like to call macro. It's actually a combi it's a much more complex uh, query. So it's actually, a union of a join and uh, a data set that is everything that wasn't in the join, okay? So purists would say, uh, well, since this isn't part of the relational model to begin with, we shouldn't have this in RQL. And that's one of the things you can give me some feedback on. Should we condense RQL into the, the smallest perfect diamond of relational algebra that we possibly can, or should we include things like uh, these outer join macros. That's uh, something for you to think about. But uh, we're also going to illustrate some more syntax here, with a, which is the with clause. And a with clause is a way of having um, another query, another from and select, that can be reused in uh, other, other parts of the uh, statement that we're creating. So in this case, we're doing something that uh, you can't do in SQL because SQL does it in a way that I don't approve of, which is in SQL, you would need to uh, embed this whole with clause as a inline subquery in the predicate of the uh, last part where we've got the union down there. But in RQL, you can uh, assign an alias to this, and uh, which ends up producing a list of elements that uh, our predicate is, is looking for. So in this case, it's the names that are not in the, um, this, uh, this quer query that we had of conference events uh, and attendees. So that's what uh, is called uh, an outer join. So here's the, the bigger picture of relationships. At the top, we've got uh, what uh, the syntax is called a cross join. And what that does is create a uh, Cartesian product of everything that's on the left-hand side of, uh, or the left-hand side set and the right-hand side set. Okay, and when you combine then, you know what a Cartesian product does, it grows very quickly, and I can count probably on one finger the times I've ever done that in my entire career and actually needed to use it. A join, which is the proper relationship that I was talking about, is 
uh, actually some kind of subset of the Cartesian product, okay? And it doesn't have to be on equality, so you can use inequalities in defining your join. Also, uh, everything else is a macro like I was talking about. So there's left joins, which uh, include the not included from the, the left-hand set, and there's right joins, which are the opposite, and then there's outers, which are both of them. Okay, the other th little tricky thing that uh, I showed you there was the, the jagged result where we had one row that uh, was missing a column that all the other rows had. So this is where we uh, implement a little more type theory, and this is um, called a, either a union or a sum type in the literature, and what that means is we have a type that can be uh, only one of a set of singleton types on their own. So we're given uh, the, the first kind of type, which uh, you know, is a pat T, a pat T, a pat DA, and a pat P, those, those four kinds of columns. And, and by the way, the, 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 ty uh, the, the kind of column itself is also a type. Uh, and then we ha have the one that's the shorter version. It's only got the, the three types in it. So every row is going to be either the first type or the second type. And that's what a sum type is all about. And that's how we completely eliminate nulls from um, the, the syntax of RQL. So let's get back to our story. Uh, we're going to do a little dance here. It's kind of a minuet. Uh, it's actually, we're performing open heart surgery on our database schema. So uh, this is typical DBA work. I don't expect you to follow this uh, completely. In fact, I'm going to go kind of fast. So just take away from this the, the bigger view that if your data model is not working out for you, or actually model is not the right word, schema is not working out for you, you can, you can change it. So this is where a relational database really has an advantage over bespoke, um, bespoke data, data stores. Okay, you don't have to go back and recode everything. You can write a script that will fix it for you. So what we're going to do, uh, first of all, our conferences table, which was our original table, is now going to be kind of obsoleted. And in fact, uh, what I didn't include here was we should we should drop it. Uh, but we're now going to uh, create a view over the conference events table, which is going to replace our original conferences table, so we don't need to maintain it. It will be automatically be maintained as we update the conference events table. So that's what the first thing is doing. Then we're going to uh, do an alter table uh, on the conference attendees. We need to add a start date so that we can match up attendees uh, completely with um, the conference they belong to then we're going to have to populate the attendees, uh, this new column in the attendees table, and we do that by means of um, selecting data from the conference events where uh, the start date was before today's conference because uh, we don't have the data for that yet and also it, it wouldn't work out. Um, so that's what we're doing there. Uh, we're going to also then change the uh, primary key on our conference attendees table, we need to add a column to that. We're going to alter that table. We're going to now implement our foreign key, and that's why we had that commented out before. So like I said, don't need to understand exactly everything that went on here. Just know that uh, your, your data schema is actually mutable, OK? You can update the structure, not the, def the definition of the structure of your database. Okay, um, so I, somehow I made it through my entire career not knowing the difference between a command and a statement. So if anybody wants to call me out on this, this slide is incorrect. I call things that uh, everybody else calls statements commands. I don't know, it's just what I do. So we've already seen uh, select and select into. Uh, there's also uh, something called merge, uh, which is another macro. It's actually just, um, selecting from two sets and then applying uh, inserts, deletes, and updates to them. 
thing I like about it is that it reads very concisely like a spec, which I think is really cool. Uh, the thing that's not good about it, which has been pointed out to me, is apparently there have been papers written on why merge is bad, and the bad thing about it is that users don't understand it, <laughs> and they actually end up uh, messing up their databases. So there's a, uh, there is a point to be made that this is a not a good idea to include in RQL for that very reason. So another thing that uh, after, after this presentation, you will all be informed and you can have inf informed opinions about it. So uh, on top of the sets are set operators. And it's interesting to think about set operators uh, in terms of their analog to arithmetic which I, I find very nice. So the uh, join that we talked about is actually multiplication. Oh, and in this format, they didn't line up too well, did they? Sorry. Uh, so a join, which we've seen, is the equivalent of multiplication because we'll actually uh, potentially multiply. Well, not potentially. We will multiply, but sometimes the multiplication is 1 times 1, which ends up with 1. But we will multiply the number of rows that we get back relative to the number of rows that we started in our primitive tables. Uh, addition is union, which we, we've also seen. There's also subtraction, which you can do in two different ways, as either an intersection, okay, set, you know, think of sets again, or accept. And there's also this cute little thing called division, which, uh, which EF Cod came up with. I'm pretty sure he was the one who originated it. Uh, I can't explain it to you because I have to read the definition of division all by, uh, in order to understand it well myself. But I will tell you this, it is actually useful in some cases. Uh, and to best of my knowledge, no SQL implementation implements uh, division as a uh, operator, but we're going to do that in RQL because we want to be complete. And because, it, like I said, it is, it is actually useful. It's not just a, an artifact. Okay, let's put it all together, and I'm also going to talk about where I may have gone a bridge too far in all of this. Um, so we can, uh, you've seen the with clause, which is a way of aliasing uh, essentially subqueries so that we can plug them into our other query statements uh, in meaningful ways and, and make it more composable. Um, and we've seen the set operators, okay? Uh, I also had this uh, great idea that after looking at merge and how much I fell in love with it because it looked so much like a specification that uh, is really neat. Well, why, why don't we use merge for more than just uh, merging into a base table, which is all you can do in uh, normal SQL? Why don't we also use it as uh, you know, something that we, we can uh, create intermediary sets that uh, then we'll apply more operators to? And the way to do that was we would have to have a, a pass-through operation. So the pass-through would go in the same place as the um, set operators, but instead of performing a set operation, all they would do is pass on the set to the next step. Uh, is that a good idea? Is that not a good idea? You tell me. Uh, but we could have a couple different kinds of pass-throughs. So one of which would be a T. Think of a T in plumbing. Okay, so you might be interested in looking at uh, the results of this intermediary step, not just the final result. So a T would let you do that. Um, a multi, that would be a T where it would separate the, any uh, union or summation type into its individual si singleton types for different outputs. Um, but this is, uh, this is how we do a trans transform. This is the bigger picture of uh, everything you could do. And then uh, at the bottom, as of time. So that's where it becomes time traveling. So the default is you're uh, querying against the current state of the schema of the database and the current state of the data in the database. But we could ask it, you know, how would this look last week? How would this look last year? You know, any, any time like that. Auditing. So. There's a whole set of views on the uh, data schema for your database, uh, which some of, some of them uh, end up making, making things completely auditable. So uh, this particular view, the uh, SIS databases, 
will let you see the state of uh, your database over time. So uh, I talked about the system timestamp and the data timestamp, and also which agent uh, made that change to your database. So let's review here. Uh, sets are typed rows. Um, it's structurally transparent. We've got views over the whole thing, so we can tell you how the database is specifically designed. It's also structurally mutable, uh, which we went through a little demonstration of. Um, it does take some planning to do a mutation to your, uh, to your schema, but it's totally doable. Uh, composable, that's something we like, and maybe I've gone too far in the composability of this. Uh, time traveling, which has the interesting property of now our database is idempotent. Uh, for anyone who hasn't turn, heard that term before, it means you ask the same question, you get the same answer every, every time, guaranteed. So that's one thing time traveling does for you. Uh, logging makes it uh, fully auditable, and there's a permission system uh, that we got a brief gl glimpse of. Um, then for some closing thoughts, namespaces is a thing that uh, I didn't even touch on yet. It's very useful for administering your database. Um, won't go into that too much. Uh, next steps are things like scalar functions. So by a scalar function, I mean you take what's in one row and you create one single atomic output from that. An aggregation function kind of works in the other axis, so it aggregates over a column. Okay, windowing functions. Now we take subsets of the uh, subsets of rows that aren't just single rows and apply functions on those. Uh, pivot sets. This I'm a little bit now ambivalent on this. Pivot sets. In other words, you know, you're taking uh, your your uh, table-like output and putting it on its side, essentially. This is primarily useful for uh, uh, display purposes, okay? Whether or not it has a real use other than display, if it's just useful for display, we're really not interested in it, but uh, it's on the table. If you have an informed uh, opinion, let me know. Triggers, so we can also define uh, any kind, any kind of effect you want, pretty much, for you know, whatever it is you do. You, you insert some data, or even if you query from data from a particular row, maybe you could trigger an effect to send off a message. Okay, That's one of the things you can do. Stored procedures, so we already got a glimpse of uh, scripts, which are you know, multiple, what I like to call commands, and everybody else calls statements. Um, except this time it's with, uh, they're parameterized, so parameterized scripts with effects. And then lastly, it's something else we can implement is, well, how about arbitrary noun columns? And I think this can be done with uh, jamming, jamming nouns. Uh, so it's not built in now, but I think it uh, could very well be useful. So, uh, that's about it. If uh, you want to join the discussion, I have a group up on uh, groups. Uh, so the, the database engine itself is called Obelisk. RQL is uh, merely the scripting language over the database, but the, the scripting language pretty much defines the whole functionality of it. Uh, I was influenced by the third manifesto by Darwin and Date and they really get into the, the typing of um, uh, database results. Uh, so uh, I, I didn't actually get the idea for, from them, but I, I read their book and it's, uh, they, they do a really good job of presenting that. There's also the SQL standard, uh, which if you get the recent one, um, and I think there have been two published since 2016. It cost like two or three hundred dollars. So uh, somehow I found the 2016 standard PDF out there. I don't remember where I found it. And then uh, any of the major uh, SQL implementations uh, will be very similar to the to them, except better, right? <laughs> For all the reasons that I've outlined. So uh, that's it. If you have any questions.
<laughs> yeah, uh, go to pass around the mic. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so at work, so we are in the process of implementing all of our stuff into, and we use Postgres, and we're trying to turn it into a bi-temporal database. What ended up happening is we <laughs> had to have a working set that is indexable and easily searchable, and then the historical set that is append only. Um, <clears throat> what is your take on, was that was a time traveling something that was envisioned early on when relational database theory um, uh, was formulated, or is it something that was tacked on at the later end, and um, I, I'm not very well versed in the history of it, so if, if you would please. Uh, yeah, for, I'm not an expert on the history. I do know that um, Mr. Hickey, I forget his first name, who's also the inventor of Clojure, uh, invented a time-traveling database which whose name escapes me right at the moment. That's actually what influenced me. I don't believe this was um, envisioned by, by COD or DATE. And in fact, uh, so on the way here, I uh, stayed with a friend of mine who I, I consider an actual SQL expert. And he basically ripped my uh, presentation up one side and down the other. <laughs> and he, he hated the idea of time traveling. Uh, he, also, he also hates the idea of outer joints. He said, get rid of them. You know, I said, but look how much more query language you need to write. You know, it, it, this is a, I kept telling him, this is a macro. And he says, this is not a programming language. This is a query language. Macros have no place in it. You know? so, that, so when you come up with your opinions, that's, you know, that's something to think about. I can certainly say that um, time travel and bi-temporal data <laughs> databases is very important in financial data tra tra uh, you know, tracking. So like, uh, this, this is great stuff. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and so I, get, I have an editorial opinion. I, I, I thank you for that comment. And I agree that I, I think time traveling is, is important. He says, well, it's not in the relational model. Well, there are, there are some things in the relational model. Yeah, they're not in the relational model, but they're still useful. So time traveling is one, ordering is another. So you may have noticed that some of the queries had an ordering on them. That's not, I mean, that's not part of set theory. Sets are not ordered, okay? But ordering is useful, and there are some other useful things about ordering. So things like time traveling, ordering, potentially, you know, the, what these, um, these, uh, these keywords that are actually macros and not primitives, you know. Uh, so these, these are all things to think about in designing this uh, query language. So, uh, well, since the microphone's over here for now. Uh, okay, so my question, um, as you've been building uh, RQL, have you been thinking about how it will interact with an ORM in the future? Uh, not, a, not in the least. I never, um, I've dealt with ORMs in my uh, experience, and uh, I never found them, I, I never found them good. <laughs> but, uh, for, yeah, uh, kind of a long explanation there. You're, you're putting a different, you're putting a new face on something that already exists, and making, you're adding complexity why don't you just learn how to use the query language? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So as you're building this like low level sort of system to be quite perfect, right? Do you have any particular, like do you find yourself, what end user apps do you find yourself sort of looking ahead to and saying like, oh, this will really improve that? Do you have, does anything come to mind? Yes. Yeah. And the answer is everything. <laughs> <laughs> What's the top of the stack? Everything. There is no top of the stack. So, um, and the reason being that if everyone used Obelisk or Obelisk compatible database engine as their data store, then all data across all apps would be composable. Okay? So wh why not make all data across all apps composable? As long as any app has a bespoke uh, data store, you're not going to be able to compose the data from that app with any other app's data. How do you store all this in Hoon? 
how do I? How do you store all of this in Hoon? Like, what's the data type for a table? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, right now, it's there are two forms, and there's only two forms for experimental purposes. I think one of them is going to win out. So one is map, either map or ordered map, and the other is just a list. So um, that's what it is for now. I, I probably could benefit from someone with your experience to uh, uh, you know, suggest other alternatives. But the reason I'm doing it both ways is to experiment with it um, as, as I develop the rest. But I suspect that list is going to drop out. Well, yeah, I mean, ordered map has the right asymptotics, I think, right? Because you can do a, a log n range query, which I think you need to be able to do. Yes, also lets you implement partial indices which uh, I think is, is a very valuable, there's, there's so much that I, I only scratched the surface, there's so much else in uh, you know, a, a query language like SQL, and one of them is uh, partial in indexing, which means that you define an index, say it's over three columns, but you're only asking it the question over the first two of those col columns, so that's partial indexing and ordered maps, like when, when I started, when I started diving into map and ordered map, and I thought, oh, this solves so many problems. It's like, you know, Hoon was, Hoon was built to implement this. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> Have you thought at all about the uh, migration and versioning story for uh, databases like this? Yeah, I thought it's a little scary. So um, that's one of the reasons I want to get the version pretty right at the beginning, because the thought of having to write a migration from one version to another that will work for everybody um, is a little daunting. So yeah, so like Ted asked, you know, what, what, what's, the, what's the format of the data store? How's the data actually stored? That's, it's pretty important to get that, try to get that right the first time so that you don't need to uh, change it. So yeah, it's not a very satisfying answer, but I suppose, but uh, that's the answer. Try to get it right. Related to that, what Kelvin does it start at? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Thank you. And uh, Neil was not a plant, by the way. <laughs> I actually meant, I, I meant to uh, drop that little gem there. I think this should be Kelvin versioned. Because the whole idea is to um, get it to the point where it's perfect, or you know, as close as humanly possible to perfect, because we're we're trying to achieve the er, the platonic form of a query language, right? So uh, I don't know, probably a hundred, maybe. I'll have have to get some feedback from uh, the folks who've really been del dealing with uh, Kelvin versioning to get some advice on that. But yeah, I think it I think it should be Kelvin versioned. Okay, well, thank you. All right, Jeff Fox, everybody.